The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity titled Management of Hyperkalemia in Patients with Hemodialysis-Dependent Chronic Kidney Disease, Applying New Evidence and Best Practices for Improved Patient Outcomes. Access the entire activity and complete the post-test at peerview.com forward slash YAS. Downloadable infographics are also available. Thank you for listening to Peerview Podcasts. We greatly appreciate your support and would like to hear from you. Can we ask for a favor? Participate today in a short one-minute survey at www.peerview.com forward slash podcast survey to share how podcasts play a role in your medical education routine. Again, that's www.peerview.com forward slash podcast survey to participate. And now on to today's podcast. Hello, this is Dr. Stephen Fishbane from Northwell Health in New York. Welcome to this educational activity on the management of hyperkalemia in patients with hemodialysis-dependent chronic kidney disease. Today, you'll have the opportunity to explore the differences in mechanisms of action of currently available treatments for hyperkalemia and learn how to apply this knowledge, current guidelines, and evidence to some of our most challenging patients, those with hemodialysis, chronic kidney disease. So let's start out with a visual depiction of hyperkalemia and look at the available treatment options. So it's an important problem. Hyperkalemia, as you know, may lead to life-threatening arrhythmias, sudden cardiac death. You know, the problem is that patients are usually asymptomatic. So when you have something that could lead to very serious outcomes and often asymptomatic, it points to the importance of monitoring. And we know that in the general population, hyperkalemia is not very common. It's 2 to 3% of patients but it gets to eight to 10% when hyperkalemia is defined simply as a potassium level of above six. So we see a lot of hyperkalemia in the hospital. In chronic kidney disease, the prevalence in patients with greater than stage three chronic kidney disease ranges from five to 50%. And as we know well, it increases as kidney function declines. The relationship between mortality and hyperkalemia is the classic J-shaped curve. Left side of this figure, you see that at lower levels of baseline serum potassium, the risk for death is increased. And as we move to the right-hand side, at levels of potassium that may surprise you a little bit, 5, 5.5, 6, that the risk for death is already increased. And you'll notice that among the curves here, the top two, chronic kidney disease and heart failure with chronic kidney disease and diabetes, that the risk for death is particularly accentuated. These are our patients, and that's why it's so important that we apply great care with this condition. So again, hyperkalemia depends on definition. We'll consider the normal range to be 3.5 to 5. Regarding mild, moderate, or severe, this is somewhat arbitrary. But I guess the point that I'd like to make is that even in the mild range where potassium is 5 to 5.9, there is an increased risk of renal adverse events, mortality, arrhythmias, but particularly when you get to potassium levels of above six and into the six to seven range, and certainly when the potassium is above seven, cardiac arrhythmia has become a particularly important complication and one that we need to pay a lot of attention to. So what are the factors that contribute to elevated potassium levels in our patients on dialysis? And you know, they're not that different than in other populations that we look at. So the dietary sources are often the same. And you may think that because we do dietary counseling at least once a month in these patients, that some of these foods are less important. But 
look, I think if we're honest, we accept the fact that our patients still are consuming a substantial number of these types of foods. And potassium is present in food additives, in salt supplements. So we've got to be really careful and collaborate with our dietitians. The dialysis parameters, certainly dialysate potassium is particularly important here, but other factors. So the bicarb concentration plays an important role here. And just how we dialyze the person, how long the patient is going to be on dialysis, blood flow rates, and related factors. Medications, I won't go through these because I think everybody understands these so well, but still these remain important even in patients who are on dialysis. So we do need to pay attention to them. And the fourth section here, other conditions remain important in our population. So there are four ways to look at the subject, and we need to pay attention to all of them if we're going to optimally be able to address the issue of increased potassium and how are we going to manage it. If we're going to choose to use a potassium binder, what are the attributes that are going to be important here? And as I think about it, it's clear, consistent efficacy, that it will lower potassium levels on a consistent basis without my having to worry about the patient having a bad day where they've attended a party, for example, had increased potassium intake, that it works in all populations of patients that are of interest to us. And it's valuable that it works rapidly, but continues to work on a consistent basis over time. And we certainly also want good tolerability, that it's palatable and that it's compatible with the large number of drugs that these patients use. Mechanisms regarding potassium concentration, we, of course, I think understand very well the importance here of GI absorption and GI losses. As we get to the intracellular storage, and we could never remind ourselves enough how important that 98% of all body potassium is present in cells and the kinds of shifts that we see occurring during the dialysis treatment are really important in terms of serum potassium. As we start to look to kidney excretion of potassium, which is less important in our dialysis patients, but certainly in CKD and other populations, we need to pay a lot of attention both to the kidneys and our dialysis patients, more to the effect that some of the medications might have in this realm. We now have three potassium binders that are available for use. Sodium polystyrene sulfonate has been available for decades, but more recently we've had pteromer calcium sorbitex and sodium zirconium cyclosilicate. And I'll be talking more about the attributes of these agents and how they might differ from each other. First, let's just talk about mechanism a little bit. Now, I have to say sodium polystyrene sulfonate is pretty indiscriminate. It binds to a lot of different substances and it will grab a lot of different cations that it will trap and take with it. That's important to think about. Pteromer has more specificity, but it will also bind to potassium and magnesium. And sodium zirconium cyclosilicate, which is particularly selective for potassium with the pore size exactly the same as the size of the potassium molecule. I don't want to speak about dosing, but storage temperature, I guess we do need to consider this, that room temperature maybe is a little bit of an advantage here, whereas for pteromer, we do need to maintain a cold chain with cold storage for the agent. These drugs are all indicated for treatment of hyperkalemia. The one difference was recently sodium zirconium cyclosilicate can be for use in hemodialysis patients. Now, let's take a look at an animation here. So understanding better the pathophysiology of hyperkalemia and dialysis patients. In healthy physiology, the kidney tightly regulates potassium levels. In the nephron, the proximal tubule and ascending loop of Henle absorb nearly all potassium. 
while excess potassium is secreted through the distal tubule into the urine. However, in people with hemodialysis-dependent CKD, the secretion and excretion of potassium is reduced. This leads to elevated serum potassium levels, which may be harmful or fatal. Now, let's take a look at sodium polystyrene sulfonate, SPS. So the drug can be administered orally or rectally. It's an insoluble compound, and what it essentially does is exchanges sodium for potassium. But as I mentioned before, it grabs a lot of other cations with it. It's not selective, and that's important, and I don't think we've understood that well enough. So we get competition from other cations, which could limit the binding capacity for potassium. Let's take a look at another 3D animation. Now let's focus on sodium polystyrene sulfonate. Let's look at the mechanism of action for this agent. Sodium polystyrene sulfonate, or SPS, is a polymer cation exchange resin. SPS is also a non-selective potassium binder. As SPS moves through the intestinal tract, it exchanges sodium for potassium and is eliminated by the fecal route. However, SPS is non-selective. It can also bind to other cations, including magnesium, calcium, or sodium. Pteromer is an orally administered agent. It's not absorbed. It's a cation exchange polymer that contains a calcium counter ion. It increases fecal potassium excretion, and it does it through binding of potassium in the GI tract. We believe that's predominantly in the lumen of the colon, which is good because that's where the concentration of potassium is greatest, potassium exchanging for calcium. Now we will look at a 3D animation for the mechanism of action for pteromer. Pteromer calcium sorbitex is a cation exchange polymer containing a calcium sorbitol counterion. Pteromer is a high capacity potassium binder. As pteromer moves through the intestinal tract, it exchanges calcium for potassium and is eliminated by the fecal route. Pteromer works throughout the GI tract, but is specifically designed to bind potassium in the colon where the highest concentration of potassium is found. Pteromer is selective for potassium, but can also bind to magnesium. Sodium zirconium cyclosilicate, or ZS9 as it was previously known, and some of us still will call it that. So this is an orally administered, tasteless, and odorless substance. It's not absorbed. It's an inorganic crystalline zirconium silicate compound. And the exchange here is potassium for protons, hydrogen ions, and for sodium that takes place throughout the intestines. There's high potassium specificity here. I think that's important. It's 125 times more selective for potassium than SPS is. And that gives it some special attributes. Let's look at a 3D animation of sodium zirconium cyclosilicate and its mechanism of action. Sodium zirconium cyclosilicate, or SZC, is an inorganic crystalline cation exchange polymer. SZC is a potassium binder that works throughout the intestinal tract. SZC exchanges hydrogen and sodium for potassium and is eliminated by the fecal route. SZC is highly selective for potassium. Other cations are too small to bind to SZC, including magnesium and calcium and sodium. So as we look again at the three agents that are available today as potassium binders, we have gotten to know a good amount about these agents. Pteromer will normalize serum potassium in 48 to 72 hours. Here's a really substantial difference Sodium zirconium cyclosilicate has a more rapid onset of action. So within two hours, you start to see normalization of serum potassium. Normal kalemia has been demonstrated for pteromer to be achieved over 52 weeks, as we know, and sodium zirconium cyclosilicate also. Very nice data showing that normal potassium levels can be maintained over 52 weeks. Regarding safety, Edema 
probably occurs with SPS, not really known because of a lack of research, but you're exchanging sodium, doesn't occur with pateromer, and there's some seen with sodium zirconium cyclosilicate at the higher doses in particular. Worsening of chronic kidney disease, I don't think this is a substantial problem, but it was seen in a small percentage of people with pateromer who were treated in the course of their studies. And then gastrointestinal side effects, it's very variable with SPS. With pateromer, probably about 15% of patients in the long-term study that they did. And it's seen also with sodium zirconium cyclosilicate, probably at a little bit of a lower rate. Big issue here is severe GI adverse events. Please note, if you're not aware of it already, that sodium polystyrene sulfonate carries significant warnings from the Food and Drug Administration regarding the risk for colonic necrosis. So please, especially in those special at-risk populations, use care with respect to that complication. Hypomagnesemia is primarily a side effect that is seen with pateromer in between 7 to 24% of treated patients. Hypokalemia is going to be seen in a small percentage of patients treated, but thankfully it's a really small percentage both with pateromer and sodium zirconium cyclosilicate. So in our second part, let's look now more closely at current guidelines and some of the evidence that we have for managing hyperkalemia in patients with hemodialysis treatment. And as we look at the spectrum here of going from normal patients where potassium is so carefully monitored and maintained with normal homeostasis by the body, as we look through acute kidney injury, as we get into CKD, and it's more advanced stages. And then dialysis, hemodialysis, peritoneal dialysis, and transplant. The mechanisms that are involved become somewhat different in our hemodialysis population. Dietary indiscretion remains an issue here. Inadequate dialysis, the ability to really effectively be able to remove potassium during the dialysis treatment. But we need to be sure that our dialysis in general is effective enough, and that includes carefully monitoring on a regular basis, at least once monthly, potassium concentrations. Hyperkalemia is a very common problem in patients on hemodialysis. If we look at the spectrum of chronic kidney disease, and we see that as we go from patients without chronic kidney disease into the more advanced stages of chronic kidney disease, we see that the prevalence of hyperkalemia increases, stage 5, 56% of people. In the portend study, we see that a low potassium dialysate concentration doesn't protect against hyperkalemia. So a dialysate potassium concentration of less than 2, 37% of patients had pre-dialysis hyperkalemia with a dialysate potassium greater than 3, 21%. That may sound to you a little bit counterintuitive, but think about the reasons why somebody is on the higher dialysate potassium concentration. Regarding the potassium concentration during the dialysis treatment, I'd like to remind you that as we remove potassium rapidly during the three, four hours of the dialysis treatment, that there is a rapid rebound of the potassium concentration. This starts right away and occurs over two to three hours back almost to baseline values. That is why we're going to find, I think, special utility for the use of potassium binders. This is a balance. We're trying to avoid intradialytic and post-dialysis hypokalemia while removing the excess potassium. That's what puts us at risk for hyperkalemia, balancing those to get the efficacy that we're looking for. So the key approaches that we currently use decreasing the dialysate potassium in the bath. And I think there's increasing concern there that the large shifts in potassium that occur during the dialysis treatment as we use lower dialysate potassiums might be problematic. Performing additional dialysis sessions, perhaps, using dietary restriction of potassium, and that's important 
and avoiding medications, being careful where we could avoid medications that keep us away from hyperkalemia, that's really helpful. Treatment options for hyperkalemia. I think everybody here is very familiar with the acute emergency treatments. Of course, I've got to emphasize the use of calcium gluconate. First step in the severe cases in order to stabilize the heart and prevent the potentially lethal arrhythmias. Intermediate, you start to get at dialysis, loop diuretics perhaps, and sodium bicarbonate. And then as we get into the maintenance phase, perhaps reducing the RASI drug doses, but use of a low potassium diet and really working to try to achieve that on a consistent basis while potentially using, traditionally it's been SPS, but now we have pteromer and sodium cyclosilicate as well. So let's look at a recent Cochrane review. There's evidence for the different potassium binders in terms of treating hyperkalemia, but they note that the evidence is of low certainty. And I think the issue here is that the available studies look at potassium levels, but haven't really looked at higher level outcomes of interest. So we, of course, would want to know more about the ability to affect cardiac arrhythmias, and in fact, major adverse cardiac events as well and what happens in terms of major gastrointestinal symptoms. We need large, adequately powered studies. Now, I think that we are well on our way. I mean, if we know that we can effectively lower potassium concentrations, I think the causal pathway is so well worked out here that it is highly likely that we're going to see good effects on clinical outcomes. But until that research is done, you can't be certain. So I think that there is a real white space opportunity there. And then all of that data can be used to look at cost effectiveness given the lack of definitive studies. The standard treatment options for hyperkalemia, they're really limited. So our acute therapies are really effective in getting the potassium concentration down, but they don't remove that excess body potassium. Dietary potassium restriction, you know what? We really don't have evidence that it actually works. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't be doing it. We should be doing it and very highly focused on this. But potassium is a common ingredient in many foods and, in fact, the healthiest foods that we eat as human beings. So it limits healthy food choices. And we get issues of non-adherence that we have to acknowledge and work and work and work to get it to work. Sodium polystyrene sulfonate, we know has uncertain efficacy from the studies that have been published. I think we would all agree that the tolerability of this drug is just difficult. It's gritty and very tough for patients to use. There is some issues of serious intestinal toxicity and it may not be effective without the laxative sorbitol being used with it. As we look at the different foods that contain potassium, let's first acknowledge this is a large number of different foods. Potassium, as they're in the cells of our bodies, they're also in the cells of the foods that we eat. And as an effect of that, it's really hard to completely eliminate potassium, but we can do a lot to limit the types of foods to lower the potassium that patients are consuming. So what are the reasons that patients may be not adhering to the diet? And here's a list of reasons that Professor Clegg and colleagues published just in 2020. So two-thirds eating away from home, you just can't control the amount of potassium that you're getting in. Lack of appetite, craving salty foods, too tired to cook, so you're using processed foods more. The dialysis diet is generally bland and tasteless. Non-adherence to this diet is estimated to be anywhere between 25 to 86 I know that is a very, very wide range, but there's a lot of patients that are not adherent to the low potassium diet. 
So SPS, this is a drug that was first approved in 1958. As I am speaking today, that is 62 years ago. The drug currently carries a warning for intestinal necrosis. This is a complication that could be fatal. It's more common in certain patients. We need to understand that well and certainly balance that risk against the potential benefits of treatments. But the drug does carry this important warning. And we do need some precautions here because of the exchange for sodium, which has never been very well quantitated, but we know we see it in clinical practice where volume overload may be a complication of more chronic use. So please, please use caution in the use of this agent. This was a classic study from JAMA Internal Medicine published in 2019, where essentially it was demonstrated that among people that were using SPS, that the rate of serious GI events was substantially increased. And this got a lot of press because if we didn't already know it, it brought to sharp focus the risk for serious events. Now, the intestinal ischemia was most common when seen in patients with SPS use with a hazard ratio in NOAL study of 4.9. They're relatively rare, but we need to ask ourselves, is it worth taking on that risk when we have agents that are available that may have some adverse events, some side effects, but nothing that is at all severe, dangerous, or it gets to this type of level? Pateramer. So really nice work here by Chaba Kovetsky, who showed that when you look at intervals over time, prior to the use of pateramer, you see that patients' serum potassium concentrations rising from 5.6 to 5.9. But after the initiation of pateramer, you see a really nice stabilization of potassium. And he achieves at 1 to 30 days, at 31 to 60 days, and 60 to 90 days, a really nice reduction in the potassium concentrations. Adverse events were not reported. Sodium zirconium cyclosilicate use in hemodialysis. So I had the pleasure of working as part of this study, which was the dialyzed study, I believe the first study of dialysis patients and the use of one of the potassium binders. And what we did was treat patients over the course of time. We treated them either with sodium zirconium cyclosilicate or placebo. It's a one-to-one -one randomization. And what we found over the course of time is the responder rate was 41% with SCC compared to 1% with placebo. The non-responders, which was 99% of the placebo group, that's not surprising. In 10%, it was missing one of the four required serum potassium measurements. In 2%, it was receiving rescue therapy. But in 99% of cases, what it really was, was simply having potassium concentrations that remained excessively elevated to hit the outcome. So this was a stark demonstration of the efficacy of sodium zirconium cyclosilicate and compared to placebo, the ability to get that response over a good period of time in terms of managing serum potassium concentration when hyperkalemia is present. Look at it now over time in terms of the serum potassium concentration. I'm going to ask you to focus first on the right-hand side of the slide. So the orange curves is the placebo group. And you're not surprised to see that you're starting out with a potassium level of about six. And over the course of the study visits, you see that the potassium concentration pre-dialysis doesn't really change very much. By the way, if you look at the bottom, you see the post-dialysis potassium concentrations, which are running at about 3.8 throughout the course of the study. Please appreciate there, there is a large flux between the pre- and post-dialysis potassium concentrations. What happens when you use sodium zirconium cyclosilicate? So this is really good news. Left-hand side of the slide, the blue curves, you see that almost immediately from the initiation of treatment, the potassium concentrations were lowered from a mean of about six 
down to five. And you see that that is sustained and it is sustained right up until the drug is stopped. And then you get a bounce back right at the end at the 16th study visit. When you look at the bottom at the post dialysis serum potassium concentrations, you see that they're similar to the placebo group, maybe slightly lower at about 3.5. So again, another question that will come up is how do we get rid of that flux, but a very clean, clear, consistent demonstration of the efficacy of sodium zirconium cyclosilicate to treat hyperkalemia effectively over the course of time. Regarding adverse events, there wasn't much that was seen in this study. If you look at the placebo concentrate group compared to the SEC group, you see that there really aren't any significant differences. When we look at the summary of adverse events, I'd like to particularly point to serious adverse events. And you see first, very low rate consistent with just what hemodialysis patients experience over time and no difference between SEC and the placebo group. Regarding deaths, there was one in the SEC group, zero in the placebo group, and felt to be completely unrelated to study drug. So really well-tolerated agent in this study. So as I look at the practical use of the agents, I have, now that we have FDA approval for the use of SEC in the hemodialysis population, have found it very, very valuable now for being able to treat patients that I've worried about for years and years and to be able to get that effective reduction in potassium concentration. As we think more broadly in our CKD population, where pteromer is of course approved as well, uh, it's not approved yet as far as I know in hemodialysis patients, we trade off um, issues of sodium versus calcium exchange. We talk about taste and tolerability where I think uh, the issue is mostly with SPS and just how difficult it is to use for patients. And that would also be the place where safety is an issue. So it's really important that we get patients comfortable with the idea of being able to lower potassium concentrations in a way that they will tolerate so they will be adherent with the treatment that we're providing. So could potassium binders overcome the dietary restrictions in these patients? So here's a hypothetical treatment, but this is one that I have been excited about for a long time, put forth by Sussman et al. here in the Journal of Renal Nutrition. If you look at people with hemodialysis, you could randomize them to a potassium liberalized diet where they could eat all of those foods that are so healthy, the fruits and vegetables versus current standard of care, looking at a variety of outcomes. But of course, serum potassium would be most important as would quality of life. But I think this is tremendously exciting, the idea of being able to allow patients to eat vegetables, fruits, get the pleasure of those foods, get the antioxidant effect, the phytonutrients, the fiber that is so important. And such a study, I think, would be highly valuable. So in conclusion, as we look at hyperkalemia treatment, the newer binders such as pteromer and sodium zirconium cyclosilicate have opened up new areas of the ability to treat patients with hyperkalemia. They're more specific for potassium than SPS. Pteromer and sodium zirconium cyclosilicate may be safer alternatives to SPS for the management of these patients. Sodium zirconium cyclosilicate, and this is really important, now has FDA approval for treatment for patients on chronic hemodialysis. The evidence for dietary potassium restriction has been limited. Now, that doesn't mean that it doesn't work, but again, I'd like us all to stay focused on it. But now that we have the ability to add on the use of potassium binders, I think we've got a much greater opportunity for succeeding with a larger percentage of patients. 
I think the major takeaway for us is this is a great new period in the ability to treat chronically patients with hyperkalemia. We've got two binders that are available that are better tolerated, that have consistent demonstrated efficacy, and that have a wealth of literature together to show that they work that they're well tolerated and that they're safe. Going forward, I think we're gonna to need to understand a little bit better what happens to dialysate potassium so that as we lower the serum potassium concentration with a potassium binder, right now SCC is the one that has the FDA indication for this purpose, can we raise the dialysate potassium and reduce that flux, that rapid lowering of potassium during the dialysis treatment? And might there be benefits of liberalizing the diet for potassium and for healthier foods? I thank you very much for your participation and for your attention in today's program. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post-test for instant credit at peerview.com forward slash YAS. This activity is supported by an independent educational grant from AstraZeneca LP. This activity has been jointly provided by Penn State College of Medicine and PVI, Peerview Institute for Medical Education.